It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Finnish Strong Friday presented by DraftKings, America's number one rated sports book app. And it's not just a Finnish Strong Friday. With the GOAT, Greg Cosell, breaking down the NFC South. Can't wait to talk to him about the Falcons, about Sam Darnold, about the Saints quarterback situation, about a million different things. It's also a winner's Friday. I want winners. I want people that want to win. We want people like spread the word winner, Diablo Blue. All he had to do was like a post by at Ross Tucker Pod on Instagram. It's that easy. At Ross Tucker Pod Instagram, at Ross Tucker Pod NFL, or at Ross Tucker Pod Twitter, at Ross Tucker NFL, Twitter, Instagram. I see who likes it. I see who quote tweets or retweets or replies or shares on Facebook. I see it all. I look. I look for somebody I haven't given a, a win or two yet, and I reward them. People like Diablo Blue. I love rewarding Alan Rumney, who took advantage of one of our sponsors. I believe it was 1-800-Flowers.com. Congratulations to you, Alan. Both of you guys, Diablo Blue and Alan Rumney, you both get a signed picture or press pass, not many left, or football card, whatever you want. Just email me, ross at rosstucker.com. The YouTube shout out is Chris Hill. Chris Hill subscribed to youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL, which by the way, would be a, a great day to do that today because I am doing this from an undisclosed location. So you will see me wearing a hat, I think for the first time ever on the show because my hair is a mess. You'll see weird house behind me. Anyway, you should check it out. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. But Chris Hill said, I really just want to hear my name on the show. Bang, Chris. That just happened. Your name is on the show. Now what you need to do is email me, ross at rosstucker.com. Let me know who you want to give your cameo style shout out to, and I'll be happy to do that. I just did a cameo this morning already for another one of our listeners for their wife for her birthday. So I love it. You get it for free, Chris. All you need to do is subscribe. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. All right, Greg, we are talking NFC South today as our division by division series continues. Really looking forward to it. It's a very interesting division. If people didn't check out Greg's thoughts on the NFC East a couple weeks ago, do that. NFC North last week. You can always check that out. And you can always check out everything Greg does at Greg Cosell, but NFC South, Greg, I mean, it's fascinating. I know you don't like to rank them, so I'll just go. <laughs> I, I'm going to go alphabetical order, okay? <clears throat> okay. Every one of these teams, by the way, totally interesting. I mean, Atlanta, you've got a new coaching staff with Arthur Smith. They elected not to go quarterback. They are keeping Matt Ryan as their quarterback. They drafted Kyle Pitts. As we record this, Julio Jones is still on the roster. That might not be the case when we play this. It's a long story. But what matters right now is the new coaching staff and what appears to be confidence shown in Matt Ryan and his ability to still play at a high level. Do you concur with that assessment? Oh, I think Matt Ryan can still play at a, at a very efficient level. He's a quarterback that needs to be protected. And I think that's the most important thing. And I think they feel that that's an area of concern because they address their offensive line with their third round pick and their fourth round pick in the NFL draft. So I think that they feel that that's an area that must be addressed. I think they feel good about two players, Jake Matthews, the left tackle, who's going into his eighth season. I don't believe he's missed a game in his last six or seven seasons. And I think they feel very good about Chris Lindstrom, the right guard, who's going into his third year out of Boston College. Other than that, 
I think they feel that this offensive line needs some competition and some work. And that's very, very important with Matt Ryan, who at this point in his career is certainly a, a pure pocket quarterback, has always been to some degree. He can move a little, but he's a pocket quarterback who needs to be protected and secure. So, Greg, there's a lot of factors, right? And there's a lot of different ways the Falcons could have gone. I'm just curious, knowing what you know, at number four, forget the finances for a second. Would you have thought about Fields or Mac Jones? Or do you feel like, man, especially with Lawrence, Lance, and Zach Wilson off the board, that you would have stuck with Matt Ryan? Forget the finances. I know I know you can't do that. I know that's part of it. But I'm just curious to hear how you would evaluate Matt Ryan at this stage of his career versus getting a young guy in there like Fields or Mac Jones? Well, I think the feeling is that this is not a bottom of the NFL roster. Um, I know their record was poor last year, 4-12. and 12. They were in many, many games. They were rarely blown out. I think the feeling with a new GM and a new head coach is we do not have a bottom of the NFL roster. We can compete. And Matt Ryan can still play at a more than efficient level, likely for another two years. And their decision was to take what, who was, in my view, the best prospect in this draft. So I don't argue with that decision one bit. So, okay, let's get to that a little bit. So, again, um, we have to record this a little early. There is a chance that Julio Jones is traded while we're actually, this, you know, while that we post this show. Let's just assume, Greg, there's a lot of smoke there. Let's just assume Julio Jones will be traded, even if he's not at this exact moment. Let's talk about the weapons that the Falcons have for Matt Ryan. Calvin Ridley, Russell Gage, and now we've got, obviously, Kyle Pitts. This Russell Gage, sixth-round pick in 2018, I don't really know where this guy has come from, but he's pretty solid. Yeah, he came out of LSU, was not a big-time receiver there in terms of volume or numbers. Last year, I believe he caught over 70 balls, the large majority out of the slot. Um, I would think that that's what he is, that he's more of a slot receiver than an outside receiver. Ridley had his best year a year ago. He's an outstanding route runner, can create separation at the top of his uh, route stem as well as any receiver in the league. Pitts, I think, becomes the key player because Pitts can line up all over your formation Ross, and he's basically a, just a receiver. He, he's not a tight end. He's a receiver. So I think they feel with Pitts uh, that they can do a lot of different things formationally and that he can present matchup problems for their pass game. Last question on Falcons offense. Can Kyle Pitts, again, assuming Julio's not there, can Kyle Pitts do some of the things that Julio did or entirely different players not going to run those same routes, not going to do those same things? Uh, that's uh, hard to say because Julio, you know, he's a first ballot Hall of Fame type receiver. And in his prime, he was 6'3", 225, and he could run. He could get on top of the defense. He could run away from coverage. I think Pitts is a special, unique talent, and I think he can be a really, really good player. But I'd be very leery at this point. And, and I loved Pitts' tape the last two years, to be honest with you. Um, so, But I'd be hard-pressed to say he's going to do what Julio Jones did in his prime. Uh, but Pitts can do an awful lot of things. And one of the most important things Pitts can do, because he can line up anywhere, is he can create defined looks for Matt Ryan before the snap of the ball. And that's very important for quarterbacks. Okay, let's get to the defensive side of the ball. They've had a lot of issues there. I'm still not overly impressed when I look at what they're lining up with right now on the defensive front, Greg. No, and I think this is an area where it'll be a work in progress. Um, they feel good about three or four players on this defense, and I think the rest they, they're trying to figure out. Um, I think they feel really good, obviously, about Grady Jarrett, who's one of the best three techniques in the NFL. Other than that, I, I think they're hoping to get better play from Dante Fowler, who they signed to a big deal, who had, came into the league as a high pick. I think they really like Jacob Tuoti Mariner. Uh, and they they hope he can become a better player and an impact player. 
the players they really do like are their linebackers. In this era in the NFL where you have to be able to play with athleticism and defend the pass at linebacker, I think they really like Deion Jones and Foya Luakon. I think they're two players that have athleticism and can play the pass. When you get to the secondary, there's a lot of questions here. Um, I think they love A.J. Terrell, first-round corner. And beyond that, I think we have to make it through the OTAs and training camp, Ross, to see uh, how that shakes out. And so defense is a definite concern for this team right now. I remember watching Foye play safety at Yale. Correct. The first three years. And, uh, man, he was a good player in the Ivy League. All right, let's get to the Carolina Panthers. Fascinating what they did at the quarterback position, paying money to move on from Bridgewater. Yes. Giving up draft picks to bring in Darnold and skipping the opportunity, passing on the opportunity to select Justin Fields or Mac Jones. I, I got something I got to say, Greg. Is it crazy that I think Teddy Bridgewater – is a better quarterback right now than Sam Darnold, or at least might be? Well, I would disagree with that, Ross. I think Teddy Bridgewater has essentially proven in his career that he's a low-level starter and likely a backup. And that's why Teddy – and the league has told us that. That's not an interpretation. The league has told us that. Um, so Sam Darnold's going into his fourth year. He was a consensus top-five pick. Some thought he'd be the first pick. Um Obviously did not play to that level with the Jets, but there's a lot of people who believe that Sam Darnold can still become a quality NFL quarterback. And this is theoretically his last shot to do so with Joe Brady and the Carolina Panthers. This is a team with a lot of weapons. They have a great back. Uh, they have very good wide receivers. The O-line is clearly a work in progress. That's the concern. Um, the concern with Darnold has always been turnovers. Darnold apparently which I didn't study through a lot of interceptions in high school. He certainly did in college. He's done that through his first three years in the league. So the concern is that you can't get that out of him, that that's the way he plays. We, we will find out. But Sam Darnold does have physical talent. And now he'll be in a good situation with good receivers and a good offensive coordinator. Yep, they still got DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson. They lost Curtis Samuel. But in comes Terrace Marshall, who Joe Brady's familiar with. I still don't think their offensive line is a strength, Greg. That's I would still agree. an issue for me. I, and I would agree with that. Um, they brought in Pat Elfline, who is, was a high pick when he came out of Ohio State, hasn't quite played to that level. There's definite concerns at the left tackle position, who's going to play there. Um so, yes, the offensive line is, a, is an off-season work in progress, and you're 100% correct. We'll be curious to see uh, how Sam Darnold and McCaffrey work together. I, I think my first year, maybe my second year, doing the U.S. Army Bowl, I think those guys um, played together. I think they were on the same team in the U.S. Army Bowl back in the day. What about the defense, Greg? They went really young last year on that side of the ball. And you know what? They weren't that bad. And I feel like they got better over the course of the year. They've added Hassan Reddick. They've added J.C. Horn to guys like Brian Burns, Derek Brown, Etor Gross Matos, Shaq Thompson. And, like They look to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, like they have a chance to be a, a decent amount better than they were last year with how young they were. Yeah, two points on this. Number one, it appears that they're going to make a change to more of a true 4-3 with three linebackers as opposed to what they did a year ago where Jeremy Chin essentially played linebacker and they played with three safeties as their base. Because just looking at the personnel, the people they brought in, they brought in Denzel Perryman, they brought in Hassan Reddick, they still have Shaq Thompson. So it appears that they'll go more as a base defense, depending on how many snaps of that they play, but as a base defense – it would be more of a true 4-3 with three linebackers. The second point I would make about their defense is they were pretty zone-heavy a year ago, but they drafted J.C. Horn. Um, they signed A.J. Uh, Boye. They drafted Keith Taylor in the fifth round from the University of Washington. These are man defenders for the most part, particularly Horn and Taylor. 
Uh, Boye certainly can line up and play man as well. So I'm wondering if they have made a decision, an organizational decision, that they need to play a higher percentage of man-to-man coverage, Ross, which, you know, Horn is, is at his core a man-to-man defender. Yeah, it's a really good point, right? Like, you wouldn't draft J.C. Horn if you're going to play a lot of zone. You wouldn't think. You would think not. I mean, you know, to me, you don't draft him to play off coverage zone. Totally agree. Let's get to the New Orleans Saints. Three out of three fascinating teams in this division. Loving this series we're doing. Obviously, no more Drew Brees. And it's a full-fledged competition from everything we've heard. Taysom Hill, Jameis Winston, how do you think that that plays out, Greg? You know, Ross, I, I'm no good at that kind of stuff. I have no idea how that plays out. Um, you know, and, and I think they'll stay close to the best on that. I don't think we'll have any major information until we get through the majority of training camp. I think they'll keep that very, but, very close to the best. But don't you think, Greg, but, but don't you think, here's the way I look at it, and they would never say this publicly, but if it's close, I believe Jameis Winston will be the starter so that they can use Taysom Hill in the ways they've used him the last couple of years with Drew Brees. I believe if it's close, Winston's the starter so they can have Taysom Hill in that specialty role. You could well be right. I, I really, again, I'm not good at, at, at deciding this. Uh, you know, I think that we saw Hill play four starts last year. There were some good things and clearly some things that needed to be worked on. You know, Jameis, he had some great, great moments in his career with the Bucks, and he also had some troublesome moments. Um, but he was a high pick in the draft. Wasn't he the first player chosen? I believe he was. So uh, that's a very hard question to answer. The, what they do have is one of the top offensive lines in the league. And they do have Alvin Kamara, who's a phenomenal back. They've got still have Latavius Murray. Um, you could argue at receiver, other than Michael Thomas, that there's some guys that that they're uncertain about. But the O line is really, in many ways, the starting point for this offense. It's clearly one of the best in the league. Yeah, really. Whoever starts, you've got one of the, a top five O line for sure to go along with the security blanket that is Kamara. Michael Thomas, you're right. Uh, although I'd bet a lot of money that one of these other receivers, whether it's Traquan Smith or Callaway or whoever, that they step up and end up being pretty productive. What about the defensive side of the ball, Greg? It feels like they've sort of been up and down on that side. But last year, there were games where they were like lights out on defense. Other games, not as much. Yeah, well, they've essentially made the decision – to be a nickel-based defense, almost as their, their base defense. Uh, Cha- Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, besides being their slot corner in a true nickel, is essentially their Sam linebacker. So they play a very, very high percentage of nickel. So uh, they're playing with two stacked backers. Demario Davis is one, and the other could well be the rookie out of Ohio State. They drafted in the second round, Pete Werner. Um, it'll be between Pete Warner and Zach Bond going into his second year. And Bond was an on-the-ball player at Wisconsin and a pass rusher trying to make the transition to playing off the ball as a stacked player. But that's the way they predominantly play. They play as a base nickel because Gardner Johnson has that kind of skill set. Last but not least, Greg, uh, maybe the – least interesting team in the division, the defending Super Bowl champions with Tom Brady. Hardly uh, pretty surprising that you could say that, but it's true. I mean, they've got all 22 starters back. It's never happened before. It's essentially the same team. They've added guys like Joe Tryon in the first round. Jalen Darden in the fourth round. They did get a developmental quarterback, Kyle Trask, in round two. They were playing very well, clearly, Greg, towards the end of the year. I guess it was after that bye. They made an absolute change. What did they What did they change? What did you see? Uh, they were an okay yeah. team. I mean, they were good, but they're losing to the Bears. I mean, they were losing these games. They, they get smoked by some of these teams. All of a sudden – after the bye, down the stretch, and in the playoffs, 
They were a different team. What jumped out to you? Well, I thought their O line started to play better, uh, and Brady played at a really, really high level. I thought that Brady, uh, over the last whatever number of games it was, Ross, after the bye, uh, and maybe even a bit before, really started to play well. Um, maybe it was a comfort with the offense. Um, I'm sure the offense was a combination of Arians and what Brady likes to do from his years in New England. And I think that was probably a work in progress through the early part of the season, trying to find the right balance between Bruce Arians, who's been in the league a long time and has very strong convictions about his offense, and Tom Brady, who's been in the league for a long time and was unbelievably great with what he did in New England. So I'm sure it was comfort, but it just appeared on tape as well that all of a sudden Brady started to throw exceptionally well. And I think the O-line clearly started to play better. So if you looked at this team and said, the Bucs aren't going to win it again because of, is, is there a weakness on the team? Is there a concern? You know, barring injury. Right. Is there a, a of course, is there a spot where they can still be had or where you think teams will attack them or might be able to beat them? I mean, look, you and I both know how hard it is to repeat a Super Bowl champs, and it's very easy to say with all 22 starters back that they're, they're the favorite, and that's easy to say. You know how seasons play out. I mean, this is a really good starting group on both sides of the ball. Um, I thought that the two linebackers, Devin White and Levante David, played at a really, really high level down the stretch and through the playoffs. Uh, and clearly, they are two linebackers that fit today's NFL, highly athletic. They can defend the pass. Uh, Levante David, hey, he matched up to Kelsey in the Super Bowl. Devin White is a great blitzer. So I, I think that's a position they're really, really strong. Um, I think that Todd Bowles, the D coordinator, did an outstanding job in the secondary because my sense is that people would have thought that the two corners, Carlton Davis and Jamal Dean, when he was healthy, are players that are theoretically beatable, but obviously it did not hurt them due to other factors, due to their pass rush and due to the play of their linebackers. Check him out on social media, always at Greg Cosell. That's where you can find all of his content, the NFL Films Guru. Next week, wow, another awesome division, the NFC West. Should be incredible. Greg, thank you so much, as always. Thanks, Ross. Absolutely love Greg Cosell. And I should have mentioned this before I threw it to the big show, but clearly Greg and I had to do this interview before Julio Jones got traded. So if you see that I'm at an undisclosed location and we had to do it. By the way, I've, I've actually met a couple of listeners down here where I am at the undisclosed. I'm at the Jersey Shore. Not a big secret. But anyway, I met, met a couple of listeners already at the Jersey Shore, which was phenomenal, which is why I wanted to do the interview with Greg before I came down here. So obviously I talked with Greg before the Julio Jones trade went down. but. It makes me even happier that I asked him that question about Kyle Pitts. Also makes me happier that Greg is such a good father. His daughter calls him every morning on her way to work right before Greg and I start recording the show. I love it. I hope his daughter listens to the show and gets her dad a story from myfrontpagestory.com because it's glorious. It's the best Father's Day gift ever. I would certainly want it more than anything else that people typically give me. It's something that he will adore and keep forever and hang somewhere in his house, in his man cave, whatever. Myfrontpagestory.com. You still have time for a Father's Day gift. Tux Takes. Morning, Ross. Let's start today with the news with some quarterback news. Aaron Rodgers officially a holdout from mandatory mini camps in Green Bay and Cam Newton out of practice after hurting his hand. No real surprise with Aaron Rodgers, right? I think we all knew this was coming. It is funny to see the daily reports about Jordan Love and how Jordan Love's performing both positively and negatively. The first day wasn't that good. Two-minute drill the next day. Oh, he lit him up and the coaches are fanning him and whatever. You know, <clears throat> there are people that say, well, listen, 
if Jordan Love does well, then maybe the Packers will be more willing to move on from Aaron Rodgers. Hello? That's what he wants. He wants them to move on from him. That's what he's trying to accomplish. That doesn't hurt him. That helps him if Jordan Love and they want to move on from him. That's what he's hoping happens at this point. And then as for the Cam Newton thing, pretty interesting. Uh, It sounds like he'll be fine by training camp, which is what matters most. But these are not good reps that he's missing out on. And he's giving Mac Jones more of an opportunity. And a lot of times you go back and look at when they go from a veteran quarterback to a young rookie quarterback. A lot of times these are how these transitions are made. There's some sort of injury. And then after there's this injury, the younger guy gets more reps. And all of a sudden, he's like the starter. Tux takes. Let's get to some wide receiver news. Falcons' Calvin Ridley reportedly had surgery recently on his foot while Cowboys' Amari Cooper expected to be out until at least through the start of training camp with some sort of ankle issue. Right. So neither one of these are good, Bry, at all. I, I mean... Calvin Ridley, I, I know they said somewhere that it was a minor surgery. Yeah, I'm not I'm not feeling that. I mean, there's nothing minor about a guy having to get surgery on his foot in June. That means either a problem or an issue cropped up or it's been lingering. Either way, not good. Something to keep an eye on. You really don't want to have surgeries, right? You really want to try to avoid surgeries as much as possible. So when a guy gets one, especially in June or whatever, that's a concern. We'll see how it affects his availability for the start of training camp and the start of the season. And somewhat similar to Amari Cooper, either this is a chronic issue or it's lingering that they don't believe he'll be ready for the start of training camp. Neither one of these are good situations. And I know right now it's downplay at season because of course they don't want people to get all upset and nervous. They don't want to, you know, raise a red flag. I'm telling you, raise the flag. Okay. It's a little bit concerned. They might both be fine, but it's not good. Tux takes. More injury news. Chiefs lineman Kyle Long suffers a lower leg injury. It's going to keep him out until the start of the season. And the Niners suffering a pair of season ending injuries as well. Right. So Kyle Long, I mean, this is why he retired in the first place, right? I mean, these are the issues that he has had throughout his career. He just couldn't stay healthy. It's why he said, I'm done. I'm moving on. And now it happens again. Now he suffers another injury. You know, in some weird way, Bri, this actually helps the Chiefs a little bit. They got a lot of depth and a lot of guys competing for roster spots along the offensive line. My guess is because the injury was suffered before training camp, they'll be able to put him on PUP. And so my guess is he'll be on PUP for the first six weeks of the season. And so it actually gives the Chiefs like an extra roster spot. And then they'll decide what to do with him. The Niners, I think, actually canceled practice after these injuries, because these are guys, you know, these are depth guys that, you know, more than likely will play at some point this season for them that they're losing. Tux takes. And last bit of news, cornerback Jonathan Joseph announced his retirement after 15 years playing in the NFL. Packers tight end Jay Sternberger suspended by the league for the first two games of the season after a DUI arrest. Well, listen, I played seven years in the NFL, and I started football in sixth grade, which means I played 18 years of football. So anytime a guy like Jonathan Joseph plays 15 years in the NFL, I am incredibly impressed, incredibly impressed. That is a remarkable career. He made a ton of money, had a lot of success, was on some good teams, Uh, Tip of the cap to him. Literally, I can do that today. Tip of the cap for those of you watching on YouTube. And Jay Sternberger, evidently, um, you know, I think he he had a statement where he said he was taking maybe antidepressants and then he had a couple alcoholic beverages and got pulled over. And that's why he's got 
two games. This was like last January, maybe like a year and a half ago. I guess the NFL waits to make sure everything is sort of adjudicated adjudicated at that point. Shout outs to Pizza Boy Brewing, Sportaculture, Vision Comics with an X, HumanHeadNYC.com. We shall be back on Monday. Check out the other shows, Even Money, Fantasy Feast. Awesome this week. And by the way, Andrew Brandt has been on a roll on the Business of Sports podcast. I hope you guys check that out. Other than that, I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mentioned DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, it doesn't always. Sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in sight 